Okay, I went to graduate school in 1985 to be a seismologist, and uh, I was very, I'm very grateful that I, early on, uh, was turned on to space geodesy by Duncan Agnew. I knew nothing about space geodesy, but he recommended that I go to the Fall ADU, and he said, just go to space geodesy sessions. So in that session, I have very, you know, I won't take deep memories. Anyway, I had memories of looking at lots of pictures of VLBI antennas, satellite laser ranging uh, laser stations and, and large tape drives. I still have memories of these tape drive talks. Um, my take on this was uh, geodesy, space geodesy was an expensive thing with big instruments that, and you had to be in the government to play. You had to be at NASA, you had to be at the USGS and there were, it wasn't an exciting crowd, it was kind of a older crowd. And, um, you know, I look out here and I just see a lot of young people. I see a lot of excitement. I see the AGU geodesy sessions being bigger by 20% every year. So I see that we've done a lot of things by bringing GPS and other instruments to uh, science. So this is a, an olden day plot. And I just kind of put it up there to contrast with today. You know, every single point was a, a treasure and you knew who collected the data and you spent weeks on it. Today, we just have so many vectors that you don't really get the sense of the data, you don't look at the data as much, and that's a challenge. But the other side of the coin, I feel like a lot of people in earth science think these vectors are icky, that producing them is icky. And I was told when I was looking for a faculty position, but you know, don't let anybody know you know how to make those vectors. Don't let them know you know those observable equations, because you won't get the job unless you talk about faults. And maybe that was right. But my point, one, uh, you don't know the observable equations, you can't innovate. Now maybe, maybe you can make lots of vectors, but you can't do anything beyond that. And I'm going to tell you about something I worked on in the late 90s, it has nothing to do with geophysics, and it was called time transfer, which has nothing to do with Star Trek. It's just comparing clocks. So what I did was compared clocks using GPS. Uh, the blue system was the old system, the red was my system, it was just a really cool system to figure out how to do something better and it allowed me to work on, work on a sub-daily GPS problem that I'd never done before. I'd been making vectors for 10 years where I could average for 24 hours. All of a sudden, I couldn't hide my errors. I had to look at all my errors, I had to look at all the parts of the observable equation. And when I thought about using high-rate GPS for seismology, I was ready, because I'd thought about those errors for two years, doing the timing problem. Now, of course, the earthquake in this problem is at time zero, and it's kind of small and not interesting, but I was very fascinated by those oscillations caused by multipath which in this case was bigger than the signal from the earthquake. How did I know it was multipath? Well, it came back every day four minutes earlier. Those frequencies of those oscillations tell you how far away the reflector is. And that's exactly the same physics, same observable equation information I use to estimate snow depth that is shown on this plot. Everything I learned from timing I used in seismology, which I used to estimate snow depth on that plot. So I, I don't see how you can innovate unless you really take apart your system and learn it in great detail. Now, same goes for looking at vegetation. Um, that's looking at scatter. A lot of people post MP1 statistics on their website to show when a receiver's failing. I'm not aware of other people looking at it to say, hey, there's something interesting there. And then this one is uh, SC02. You can use it to study episodic slip, or if you're like me, you go, wow, that looks really flat. I bet I could do tight gauge measurements. So that's what I did. Uh, down below, the black is a tide gauge, a regular tide gauge, and the blue are my tide gauge estimates. So I have some other points. Uh, <laughs> I sometimes uh, feel like uh, geodetic science uh, is uh, treated a little differently than observational geodesy. And I would like to see more faculty hires of observational geodesists. We need both. You can't just hire one or the other and teach more classes so that we have more students who know about geodesy. And, uh, yeah, geodesy, I was recently on a national committee where I was asked to speak for structural geology. I, I found that so frightening for both structural geologists and for myself. Uh, just because I did tectonic geodesy does not make me a structural geologist and people should realize that. Um, I hope that I've convinced you that there are a lot of interesting problems that can be solved with lots of different geodetic instruments, not just GPS. I've learned something from everyone I've worked with. You don't have to just work with geologists. And I would just leave with the comment that GPS is not a solved problem. Uh, there's still interesting things to be done with GPS.